Hi everyone, um, I'm Sharon Cunial, the Regional Land Care Coordinator for the New South Wales Central Tablelands and part of a team delivering this series including Rowan Leach and Liz Davis from Local Land Services and Mel Keel from the New South Wales Land Care Program. Before we begin, can I please ask you to remain muted and to keep your video off. So welcome to our fourth and final session of Future Proof Your Business with Paul Ryan. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we all meet today. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Before we start, I'd like to run through a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, all sessions will be recorded and available online within 24 hours of this session and your participation in this webinar will be regarded as your consent to being recorded. In the event of a possible tech failure, don't despair, we'll still be able to email you a link to the presentation. There'll be a Q&A session, so please put your questions anytime into the chat function or put them to Paul at the end of the presentation. We'll put up a survey link for session four in the chat, um, so please take a few minutes to provide your feedback on this webinar to be in the running to win Charles Massey's acclaimed book, Call of the Reed Warbler. Um, and with regards to book prizes, the team chose Terry Moody as a session two prize winner of the Negotiators Toolkit by Alan Parker uh, because of his insightful comments and questions um, and survey respondent Trish Smith as second uh, session three winner of the book In the Arena by Bo Robinson. And so we'll be in touch with both of you guys soon. Um, I'm thrilled to invite our presenter for this series, Paul Ryan from the Australian Resilience Centre to begin our final session. Thanks, Paul. Great, thanks Sharon. Uh, so welcome folks, my name's Paul Ryan from the Australian Resilience Centre. Um, welcome back if, you're, if you've been to some of the earlier sessions and a warm welcome if you're just joining for this particular session. What I want to do in this session today is really try to, to bring everything together that we've talked about over the last three sessions. So in the last three sessions we've kind of you know, gone through a range of concepts and, and gone down some rabbit burrows with some of this stuff. What I want to do now is try to bring it together in a fairly coherent way that you can use in your thinking, your planning, your discussions with, with your family, with you know, your business partners, whatever it might be, in thinking about how we do this stuff at the farm scale on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's what we're going to do, we're just try to wrap it up in a, in a fairly coherent way. If you wanted to go into more detail, go back to some of those um, earlier sessions, session one to three, has more detail on some of these concepts. So I'm just going to share my screen with some slides here. And really the, the, the process that we've been through, the, the way I've talked about thinking about resilience is, is to talk about defining resilience. What is it? What do we mean by resilience in our own um, place, our own system, in our own business, whatever it might be talked about diagnosing so trying to understand where is you know the where are the resilience problems where are the issues that we're trying to to think about and how do we go about tackling making some change in those we talked about designing resilience actions and there's some design rules and I'll cover a little bit about those again and then we'll you know talk a bit more about this doing how do we do this in practice so that's that's the sort of broad flow of what we've been through and what I'm going to try to wrap up in this session today. So when we talked about defining resilience, we, we talked about the this need to really, what you need to do is kind of describe the, your system. So the people, the place, the production system, the ecosystems, the landscape as a linked system, that's really fundamental. Resilience is about systems and so describing it as a system is a real cornerstone and that's a, a fundamental step and I would argue really strongly to draw it and it might feel really stupid, it might feel really silly, but actually sitting down and drawing it, getting pieces of paper and, and sketching out what's the system that we're talking about here, who and what is linked together and how 
And it's when you start to draw, and there's good research on this, actually, when you draw, you use different parts of your brain to what you would normally do in your day-to-day -day thinking. So when you're actually drawing things out, the act of drawing, the process of drawing, it uses different cognitive pathways. Seeing things drawn out actually has a different effect, seeing it visually. So you might understand, of course, you understand your system, your farm, but actually drawing it out forces you to think about and look at it in different ways and you'll get new insights by doing that. people in, in Africa. The, the stuff on the left there is work that I did with Mel in just understanding the community around Yeovil and how it was organised and structured. Like I say, it doesn't matter what you draw, it's the process of drawing. And then you can list out those events, the things that you think might impact on your system that you're worried about um, and that create those stresses. And that's just like a fundamental cornerstone of, of doing this resilience work in practice. And then you can ask a couple of simple questions. So what is it that you, about what you've drawn out that you want to make resilient? Is it about just the farm? Is it about the business? Is it about you, your family? Is it about the community? Is it about the connections that you have to that place? What are you trying to make resilient? Because that um, you know, challenges us to say, well, what are we actually going to focus our resilience effort on? And does it need to be this way? If this is a thing that really matters to us, does it matter if it changes a bit? Does it matter if it changes a lot? And that'll focus our resilience effort, if you like. And then the resilience to what? What are we trying to be resilient to? What are the things, the stresses that we want to worry about? And, and so just listing those out and understanding those is a really important, simple step. We talked about diagnosing, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you know, the tip of the iceberg is where these events are, the big things that capture our imagination and our focus. But a real key question here is, are we reacting or being reactive to those events or are we trying to be proactive? And that's really a key um, decision point there about, are we going to try to be proactive so that we're not caught responding to those events all the time, being reactive and running on the hamster wheel at the tip of the iceberg? And you know, what, what's the pattern that you see in those, those events in relation to yourself, to your family, to the business, to the farm, the landscape, the community, whatever it might be, that'll, that'll tell us, you know, what's, what are we kind of responding to here? What's the pattern that we can see? Is that pattern shifting and how do we respond to that? And as we talked about, if we really want to make change, it's, it's, you have to work on, on these structures. You've got to work deep down to make change. And it's really getting down to understanding what's the structure. That could be the structure of the business. It could be the structure of the landscape, you know, the farm layout. Um, it could be the structure of the industry that you're in that is really impacting on you, creating those stresses and leading to those events. And really the deepest change that we can do is down here in that um, the, the very deep level of, our beliefs and assumptions about what we're doing and, and that might constrain our thinking or it might guide our thinking, it might create new opportunities, but really it's how we think about these problems that's at the base of all of this and that'll determine the structures that we build and create, it'll determine the patterns that we get and it'll determine the events that we have. So if we want to make change, we've got to work deep down here about the structures and about our beliefs and understanding of the way you know we organise ourselves. We used this um, cycle, the adaptive cycle or the boom and bust cycle to, to help think about change over time. So we know that this you know, systems, farm systems, landscapes, industries go through these patterns of sort of building up growth, maturity, and then this release phase. So a really simple kind of thing is to ask where, where are we at? Are we in this growing and expanding phase, the growth phase? Are we in this maturity phase? So if we're here, if we're in this expanding growth phase, one of the key questions is really, are you investing in resilient systems approaches? So are we building resilience 
um, as we're growing or are we becoming more specialised, more narrow? Have, are we keeping flexibility and diversity? Um, and what tends to happen is as we get bigger and grow, we tend to specialise more and we often lose some of that flexibility and diversity or we, we start to become fairly rigid in our decision making. And then that leads us up to the, the top here, that maturity phase, and there's a real danger here that you get locked into just thinking um, in certain ways or doing things in certain ways and, and you can become sort of over mature if you like and, and then you're exposed, you're vulnerable to some sort of change. And, you know, we've seen that a lot through COVID, for example, and just how quickly so many big businesses went under uh, or, you know, put their hand out for government assistance um, with relatively small changes. And it was because they're kind of very thin, very brittle uh, in terms of their um, narrowness and, and their ability to respond to change. So, and, then, you know, are we, if we're in this phase, are we prepared for some kind of disruption, a major disruption in that release phase? How prepared are we? And then we can, you know, if we're somewhere else, are we in this release phase, then can you minimise the losses of those important capitals and connections so that you've got them ready to rebuild and to restart your, your growth phase again? And, and those capitals are not just financial capital, but obviously that's a really important one, but thinking about the natural capital, your social capital, keeping those intact, your, your infrastructure, your built capital, um, your skills, your etc. just keeping those things intact to the extent you can when there's an impact, uh, some kind of uh, you know, big release phase, some big disruption, trying to hang on to as much capital and as much connection as you can because they're the things that are the raw material for building into that next growth phase. Um, but if you are in this reorganisation phase, and, and let's be honest, a lot of businesses, a lot of organisations, a lot of communities really are following, you know, decade of drought, uh, the big fires, obviously, and COVID. But if we're in this reorganisation phase, now's the time to really ask some questions about, you know, what are the new opportunities here that have emerged? What things have emerged from all that terrible destruction? and the, you know, the stress of all that, but what are the opportunities that are available now that things have changed and we're coming out the other side? And, you know, are we just going to go back into the same pattern again, the same kind of loop around and building back up, or is there an opportunity to, to reorganise and to test some other ways of thinking and doing? So, you know, now's the time to sort of experiment, if you like, when conditions are a bit better and there's, you know, things that the yeah, outlook's reasonable, what can we experiment with? What can we, um, you know, test or trial in our system that, that can help set us up for future resilience? And then we talked about designing and, and when we talk about design, you know, I've mentioned this a number of times, but just planning to bounce back is not enough. We've talked about the need to bounce forward as well and, and bouncing forward with purpose. And so we need a kind of strategy. It's, you know, resilience is not just about saying, I just want to get back to where I was. Resilience is about bouncing forward with direction, with purpose, so that we, we need a, a resilient strategy. And there's a really important question to ask here when we're trying to implement resilience is to say, what's, what are our strategies here for resilience? What are they focused on? Is it just persistence? Do we just want to keep surviving? But you've also got to have the capacity to adapt and to transform in the future if, if you need to. And, and you know, that's challenging to think like that, that often we are all just trying to survive, but building up to the extent we can, the ability to adapt and the ability to transform if we need to and, and having those strategies there, you know, having an exit strategy, having, a, um, you know, the skills to, building up the skills to do something else in the future, there, you know, that's about building real resilience and having those additional kind of strings to our bow that when we need them, they're there for us to, to go in a different direction if we need to. And again, now's the time to think about that as we emerge out of a, you know, a very difficult period for a lot of people. Now's the time to think about um, as conditions are kind of improving and are, are, are good in some places is to say, okay, how do we build our resilience for the future that's that you know, we, we might um, move towards. How do we build our resilience? How do we have the ability to adapt if we need to and that ability to transform in case we need to in the future? 
So we talked about those resilience design rules then. So we have a strategy, we have this overarching strategy, but within that, we're going to be doing actions. We're going to be doing things that build resilience. And we talked about these design rules. Um, they're, you know, for building resilience and dealing with the unknowns and having, it doesn't matter what we do, if we design with resilience as a, a, a kind of built-in idea that helps us to cope with the unknowns. It also makes sure we're not undermining resilience in other ways. So we don't want to be doing things over here that's that's undermining resilience in other ways elsewhere. So using these kind of design rules to check what we're doing and check our thinking to make sure that the way we're doing, you know, building resilience in one area is not undermining it in other ways elsewhere. So there, there's the rules, I'm not going to go through them, but as, as I talked about earlier, if you're interested, you could go back to session three and have a look at some examples of those rules. But I do want to mention that it's really important when we're thinking about applying these rules to think holistically. And so if we just use the example of one of those rules about maintaining and building diversity is one of those rules and diversity is one of the best things we can have from a resilience perspective. The more diverse we are, that helps us to have um, the ability to cope with lots of different things and options into the future. Diversity is a key resilience strategy and a resilience idea. And we can think about building it, you know, from a production point of view and an economic point of view. So there's genetic diversity. We can talk about varieties and breeds, the, you know, crop rotations, the, the cropping system we've got in place, the farming system. We can talk about diversity of markets and where we send our products. We can talk about the types of products, obviously, and, and those markets I go to, and then diversification overall and including off-farm investment, those sort of things. But that, that's, you know, I think that's good and that's, we need to do that, but that's thinking about just sort of production and economic diversity. But we can also think about the same thing from an ecological perspective about our landscape. We can think about it in terms of the knowledge that we draw on and the perspectives that we bring in, you know, who are we listening to, who are we not listening to, what sources of knowledge and information, and also diversity in our social and community uh, networks that in our friends, our interest groups, our sports, our civic society around us, that having diversity in those things is, is um, important as well. So it's one thing to think about it at the farm scale and in the production system or the business, but actually thinking more broadly, more holistically about the whole system um, is going to build diversity across different parts of our system that's going to add to our resilience overall. Same with thinking about flexibility, we can think about infrastructure. So, you know, designing for flexibility, if we apply that idea to, you know, farm layout, fencing, water troughs, yards, all of that kind of stuff, that we can build in a lot of flexibility into infrastructure. But we can also build it in in terms of management strategies and other ways that, you know, we operate, you know, breeding versus training or the uh, trading or the enterprise mix. So thinking about those rules kind of holistically and thinking about where can we get flexibility, where can we get diversity, what are the slow changes we need to think about. Having that, that thinking in multiple parts of our business, um, of our life is going to make us more resilient overall because we're sort of introducing those concepts in different areas and we're thinking about it in different ways. Then if we're thinking about the doing, the, the actual practice, how do we do this in practice? And, and you know, I'm not going to go through a lot of detail of, of the sitting down farm planning or whatever, but clearly there's a really important thing here, and this has been shown again and again, successful businesses, successful business, farm businesses, they write stuff down, they had plans. And I would argue that resilience is no different. If we want to build resilience, you have to write it down. You have to record things. You have to reflect on it. You, you know, you do something, you see whether it works, and you come back and review the plan. And so the doing, you know, is is key part of that, obviously, but recording it um, beforehand, reflecting on it after and going back and reviewing the plan is really fundamental. And so like all farm planning, all business planning, resilience planning, you know, can be, it's, it's a task, it can be laborious, but actually we need to do it like we do that, those other forms of planning and incorporate it into the other forms of planning that you already do. 
I would also argue that we should be trying to make resilience a goal. So, so included into, you know, whether it's up here or written down or whatever it might be, but include resilience as a goal. We want to build a more resilient build business. We want to build a more resilient farm. We want to build a more resilient landscape. We want to build a resilient community, whatever it might be, the right level for your work. But, it, you know, having it as a goal draws attention to it, makes us think about it, makes us ask questions, it makes us accountable to something too. So including resilience as a specific goal, I think is a really useful thing to kind of get the doing right. The other thing is just applying a resilience test to decision making. And, you know, I'm not saying this is the exact wording, but something along the lines of asking, you know, will this help build our resilience or will it make us more vulnerable in some way? You know, and how and why? And, and you might go back to your drawing, your system drawing, or your sketch of how you think things are connected or interacting and, and say, well, if we do this, what's it connected to? What changes if we do this? Or if we do something and it undermines resilience, how is it going to undermine it in some other way in the farm business or in our you know, family or a community or our landscape? So really bringing that resilience test to some of the things that we do and to our decision making and really kind of put a blowtorch on them and say, is this actually going to build our resilience or is it going to make us more vulnerable? And, you know, a, a, a typical one is just taking on more debt. And we've seen that some work done in the dairy industry down here that just showed that, you know, obviously taking on more debt, people need to do it at certain times, but then it made people so much more vulnerable to subsequently smaller and smaller future events. Uh, and they became much more, you know, exposed to small price shifts and in um, inputs and those sort of things. And so just really asking that question, it's a difficult question to ask and sometimes it might be a difficult question to answer, but it's a really important kind of um, skill building thing to, to ask that question is, is this going to build our resilience or going to make us more vulnerable? And, and why, why do we think that that can be really fundamental? The other thing about doing resilience in practice is, of course, you're not going to rush out and do some massive big change, but look for opportunities to to test and to trial to experiment with things to learn in small ways and and then scale up and see what works you know what see what works and then scale up what works and so we really encourage people to to think about the idea of safe fail not fail safe so you're not going to go out and try and you know launch into something that literally could cost you the farm instead doing things experimenting, trialling things, testing things, trying something new in a way that's really safe to fail. So, you know, that it's not gonna, it's not gonna break you financially, but it's also not gonna release a, a new weed uh, that's gonna get away, or it's, you know, it's not gonna cause some kind of, you know, potential disaster to happen in, in a way that's gonna have a bigger impact. So thinking about how can I trial this in a safe way but if it fails, it doesn't really matter. I haven't, I haven't invested too much in this financially or personally, and I haven't exposed other parts of my system to that risk. So thinking about testing and trialling and testing and trialling things in ways that are safe is a really important re resilient strategy. It's a way to learn a lot. It's a way to expose yourself to new ideas and new things and discover new things about, you know, different ways of doing uh, that could lead you to whole new approaches, whole new enterprise, whatever it might be, but doing it in a way that's small and safe for a start. So I come back to this idea of how do we put this all together, that, you know, we, we spend time defining what do we mean by resilience. It's different for every person. It's different for every business. Talk about diagnosing and, and spending time looking at how we're defining and, and how we describe resilience and the linkages in our system and doing some diagnosis of that, spending some time looking at it. Thinking about interventions and, and what are we going to do? So having a kind of resilient strategy about not just uh, persisting, but actually having the ability to adapt when we need to and if we need to, to transform. and having that strategy and then designing actions using those design rules to help us be 
um, confident that we're designing stuff in ways that is going to build resilience and not undermine resilience. And then finally, the doing and, and going about practicing, and as I just described, doing that in ways that's safe. The last little piece of the puzzle, of course, is learning. And, and you know, this is a hard thing. We're not, most of us aren't kind of formal learners. We learn by doing. And, and the this, this strategies that we can use here, the really important part is that we, if we've documented things, we've written it down, we can come back and we can check that. We can test their logic. We can ask questions. And in particular, asking some kind of deeper questions like not just did it work, that's, that's a kind of no-brainer. So we did something and did it work, yes or no. But actually, what are our criteria here for, for, for success? Like, is it just about did it work economically? Well, you know, we know that, that that's not the only test. It's got to work socially. It's got to work ecologically. It's got to work ethically and morally, it's got to work for our community, et cetera. And so asking what are the criteria here for success when we're talking about resilience and, and building resilience for ourselves and our farm and our community, being really clear about, well, what, what is a measure of success and using that to help us learn and to, to check ourselves and to check the way we're assessing, you know, what's working and what's not working for us. And they're hard questions for, for us all to ask, because it's easy to just keep doing the same thing and going, oh, that worked and that didn't. Oh, well, I'll stick with what worked. But really saying, why did it work? Why do we think it's a good thing to keep doing? What are the criteria we're kind of using and, and thinking across that, you know, environment, environmental, social, economic, morally, ethically, uh, and the wider community. So all of this, you know, if we come back to where we started this whole conversation in the, the first session is really about trying to manage this kind of stress curve, our simplified stress curve. And we know there's multiple events and there's multiple stresses, but if we just think of this kind of simple idea as the dark green there, this stress curve, anytime there's some, some event, some pressure on us, stress is going to increase and, and rise up to a level. And, and as we talked about early on, really up here is is where the stress if it gets to this level if we're operating up at this level it's going to have an impact on us it's going to cause um you know changes to the way we think and act and if that stress persists for too long it becomes uh, dangerous it becomes dangerous for us mentally and physically and we just can't operate we're not designed humans are not designed to operate under high stress for too long, we can do it for short periods. But if we're in, if we're in this perpetual stress, we're not going to, we're not going to be happy in the long term. It's going to impact socially, physically, mentally. It's going to impact on our relationships. It's going to impact on us in profound ways that ultimately can be you know, not a good place to be. So when we're talking about resilience, what we're trying to do is lower that stress curve. So those actions there that you know can help us to to reduce our our resilience those uh, to reduce that stress sorry and, and build our resilience are uh, the the things that we really want to try to put in place and focus on and, and those things can can help us before there is a an event a stressful event they can help us during and they can help us after and and thinking about that what things can we do before we don't want to be trying to do things when we're right in the peak of the stress we really want to think what can we do now and particularly now when conditions are a bit better and what can we do now that sets us up to make sure we cope with those future events better, that we recover better, and that we do whatever we can to sort of reduce that stress curve, lower that stress curve down and build our resilience. That's what we're aiming to do. That's what, you know, the purpose of, of this, these sessions has been is really to think about, you know, how do we keep our stress low so that we can um, cope with and recover from, from those sort of things better. So in summary, kind of going back, thinking across the four sessions, you know, I'm trying to sum this up in just a few key dot points, but, you know, resilience is, is important because unmanaged stress becomes distress. And as I just talked about with that stress curve, ultimately that's going to lead to, to us being in a bad place and we don't want to be there. We want people to have the best quality of life, the best well-being that they can. So minimising that stress, avoiding it becoming distress and, and um, recovering as quick as we can, getting back to our lives as quick as we can is really, really fundamental. So resilience is important. It's important for us 
as individuals, it's important for our families and it's important for our communities. And we talked a lot about this, but resilience is not just about bouncing back. And, and so we need to go a step further and, and move on from that idea because I think that's actually not a very useful idea in helping us to think about the future. Um, so, you know, we prefer to think about that this idea that resilience includes the capacity to persist, to adapt and transform when necessary. So think of it as bouncing forward with purpose. We're not, we're not blindly going into the future. We're, we're being strategic and smart about it. There's times when we want to persist. Of course, we need to write out things, but we also want to be able to adapt and transform when we need to. And that's, you know, that's the ultimate is to have the ability to do those three things, to persist when we need to, to adapt when we have to change. But when our capacity is exceeded, or things are changing so much around us, we need to have the, the ability to transform and to do something else, if that's the case. We talked about this little logic, of course, you know, define it, diagnose it, design it, do it, and then learn. And, and that's really the logic. And again, I'd suggest if you need to go back and, and sort of dig through some of this in deeper detail, go and look at those previous sessions. And the last thing I'd say about resilience is talk about it. Talking about resilience, about yourself, about your own resilience, about your family, with your family, about the business and, and about, you know, with our friends, with our community, about resilience is actually a really positive thing. And I know some people are kind of jaded with the term and I don't care whether you use the term resilience, but actually talking about how people are traveling, how they're coping, what are they doing and how have they coped with certain things, what strategies that they put in place, you can learn a lot you can share a lot and that's really important conversations for all of us I think in rural communities is to to keep having a conversation about the challenges that we face and about the future that we face and I'm going to leave it there I just want to say a really special thank you to to Mel and Sharon Liz and Rowan and their organizations for for pulling these sessions together and and uh, you know, going through all the challenges of, of the technology and all of those things that have been the ups and downs of this, um, of these little sessions that we put together. But I really want to thank them and, and, and congratulate them on the work they've done and having the, the vision and the foresight to do this. I've got my contact details there. I'm really happy if people want to contact me at any time, if you've got just you know, questions, comments, thoughts, whatever, anything you want to have a yarn about. Um, I, I may not get back to you straight away, but I will get back to you. And I've got our web address there and there's just some useful bits and pieces on our website that if, if you want to have a dig around, there's different things there that you might be interested in having a look at. So just encourage you if you, if you want to dig a little bit deeper into some of this stuff, by all means, go and do that. Otherwise, thanks very much for your involvement, your participation in these sessions. I'm, I'm looking forward to any questions we've got now immediately after this session and uh, hopefully I'll see you around the track somewhere. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for that, Paul. That was an excellent summary um, and an uh, excellent place to um, start considering um, a whole bunch of questions we've got now in the um, chat function. Um, so you can also raise your virtual hand at the bottom of your screen. There's a hand, little hand icon. Um, so please, um, please use that as well and put your questions into chat and I'll pass it over to Paul. Yeah, thanks Sharon. Uh, yeah, just having a look at the chat, I mean, Trish, just your question about the opportunities to hear about attendees and how they're putting to, you know, implementing the resilience principles in their own life farm or business or whatever. And, and I think that's a great idea. We're not going to have time to do it today, but if people are interested, I'm happy to just, um, you know, have a, a, a session at some other time where we just have a free-for-all discussion and people can just throw their ideas around and talk about their experience and that sort of stuff. So if, if that's something that you're interested in, um, let us know, if, you know, put it in the chat box here or, or email um, Liz or Mel or Sharon or Rowan separately and we can, I'm completely happy that it'd be, you know, I'd love to do that, it'd be a great conversation. So, and we can learn a lot from each other, obviously. I'm the one doing all the talking here, but I'm, you know, there's a lot to learn from each other. So I think that'd be, that'd be fantastic. Um, and then going down to, 
to Rowan's question about, <clears throat> you know, we hear a lot about sort of smart goals and those sorts of things. And how do we measure resilience? You know, what are some of the measures of resilience? And it's actually a really good question, Rowan. It's a really complex kind of area. And there's actually a lot of work going on around the traps to try to work that out. Of how do we measure it? Because it is a sort of multifaceted thing. And what the, the, the way we focus on trying to measure resilience is actually to go to those rules so to look at those resilience rules and to measure some of the key things in there so <clears throat> if we use that idea of diversity that i talked about a lot over the last three sessions we can measure diversity so we can measure those different types of diversity we can measure <clears throat> you know the range of commodity types or the you know the range of species or genetic diversity, all sorts of things. And so they're the sort of indicators that we can use. And, and as we see them changing particularly, so you might measure it and say it's at this level and it's really, what's the trend? Are they going down? Is the amount of diversity decreasing over time? And that's the sort of things that you look for to see whether resilience is changing. It's harder to do than to measure some of the other things that we'd normally measure. So that's why there is a lot of work going on around this stuff. That's at the farm level. And then if you go, say, to the community level, then we're looking at measures like um, the socioeconomic type indicators. We're looking at the level of household income. A really key measure about households' ability to recover is just uh, whether they, you know, you see those, those figures about, you know, whether a, a business or a family has got access to at least $3,000 or $2,000 cash to cope with a very short-term crisis. So there's those types of measures that are more sort of social, socioeconomic measures. So there's a kind of range of things. There's nothing really nice and neat, which is frustrating. It would be nice if there was some things that we um, we could just grab straight off the shelf, but, but it, you tend to use these kind of um, indirect measures, if you like, to try and get at that question of how resilient is a system. So, and, uh, that a uh, few comments there about the interactive sessions. I, so yeah, more than happy to to be involved in those and and happy to coordinate, help coordinate that if that's useful. So anyone else that's interested, let us know and um, we can do that. Has anyone got any other questions? Any comments? Anything else? We're sort of starting to run towards time, finishing time. But is there anything else that anyone wants to add? Any other questions? Um, Paul, just Sharon here. Um, I've, I've got a question for you actually. Um, just yeah. reflecting on your idea of, um, you know, planning and monitoring and writing stuff down. Um, I've come across a lot of early industry adopters who talk about the idea that you can't manage something without monitoring it. So, in your experience, have you come across any sort of standout tools that help people gather good data efficiently? Like um, Maya Grazing is a, a classic business that offers both um, sort of smartphone and computer um, apps to manage, you know, you know, graze plans and um, cattle movement. Um, are you aware of anything else out there that people um, should know about? I think. You know, those types of tools you mentioned, Sharon, are really important for, for tracking, you know, specific things like, you know, grazing levels or stock movements and all of those sort of things, pasture growth, those sort of tools. And a lot of the grazing programs have those tools built into them, which I think, you know, it's fantastic. And if you've done one of those programs, you learn about those tools while you're doing it, and that's really great. But if you're outside of that, I don't think there's any really good generic tools. What I'd say is the best thing that I've seen after doing, you know, close to 850 workshops with people, you know, all over the place here, all around, you know, in Africa, in US, in Europe, in Asia, the, the, the number one thing I'd say is to draw. And it sounds, it, it's not a tool. It, it's a process or a practice, but is actually to draw things out. And I can't stress it enough that by drawing it out, you're using a different part of your brain and that forces you to think differently. And it, it goes through a different cognitive pathway. And when you draw it out, you, you see it differently. So 
the physical process of drawing forces you to, to think differently. And then when you see it on the page, it actually, um, the feedback that you get actually helps you to understand your system more. And it's really important if you're doing it with multiple people. So mm. if you're, if you're working with, you know, other people, so you're, you're working with your land care group or you're working with your production group or whatever, it's really crucial that you draw it out together and, and you just, you start drawing and we, you know, we're natural kind of drawers. So if you put down a piece of paper and a pen on a table and you start having conversations, someone will pick up the pen and start drawing and sketching. And that's because pre, you know, writing, that's how we communicated. You know, we would draw stuff in the dirt or in the dust or put it on a cave wall or whatever it might be. That is a natural inbuilt ability that's sitting there in, in everyone. Even if you can't draw, like I can't draw for, you know, to save myself, but it's actually just starting just to put down things on paper, drawing it out and building up a picture of it. The connections between things is the, the most powerful tool I've seen. And I'd stress to people, it doesn't matter what you draw. It's not, you're not trying to draw a masterpiece. It's the process of drawing it. It's actually just exercising different parts of your brain and different neural pathways. That's the key thing. So, um, and Liz, your example of just how to draw it is, is literally starting with something that you know. So if you're, if you're talking about your landscape and you're doing this with land care groups or whatever, is draw the boundary of the place, draw the creek through the middle draw where the town is, draw, you know, where the quarry is, the whatever, it doesn't matter. Start to put some physical structure to it, organise it, and then start to just put down the things that you're concerned about or the things that you value. It doesn't matter where you sort of start, but just start to sort of jot those down. What do, what do, what do we like? What do we, uh, you know, what, what, what do we value here? What's important to us? Or what are the threats? Doesn't matter which way you kind of start. And, and just start to put that down. The other one that um, we've done with Mel and, and um, the group at Yeovil when we were doing some work up there was the historical timeline is a really fantastic conversation starter. So just getting people to map onto a timeline, the big events that have shaped their landscape. And that's a really powerful, simple thing to do that, that um, creates lots of conversation. So uh, yeah, there's no hard and fast rules, Trish. I think just just start with a pen and paper and get get down, start to ask some questions and get that and start to encourage people to draw that. Um, so Terry, great great comment there about just uh, about those indicators, community indicators that. Um, the economic data, I agree, it, it doesn't tell us, you know, it doesn't really tell us about how a community works. So it, it's, it's useful at a macro scale. So socioeconomic data is useful at a macro scale, but it doesn't tell us about the connections. It also doesn't tell us about what's important to people. Um, and those ideas of social capital networks and community capacity is, is really I totally agree that's and and that vulnerability that we talked about so understanding sort of who's vulnerable and why not because they're socioeconomically vulnerable but because of maybe where they live or because they're more isolated or because um, you know physically where they live ge geographically where they live those sort of things and that stuff can't be drawn out of big data sets about socioeconomic data that sort of stuff it can only come from the community so I reckon there's a role for both. There is a role for that broader stuff, but but we also need to narrow that, bring it down to that sort of intimate level, our local landscape, so that we understand um, our community better in the way that we want to understand it, not necessarily on some kind of macro level um, socioeconomic data sets. Paul, I just had a comment about the excellent point of making resilience a goal in your planning. Um, there's so many models out there now, RCS and whatnot, that do what be so working on your business. Um, and resilience could really be a point here and writing it down and referring to it just like you would in any other structure in your business, I think is excellent. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, it's kind of simple, Mel, in a way, it's, but we don't often do it. We sort of just mm. talk about it, but actually saying we want to be resilient and that sharpens your mind a bit and it forces you to ask a whole lot of questions. And so just putting it in a plan in the same way as, like you say, you have a, you know, you might have a grazing plan, you might have an economic plan, business plan, the um, farm layout plan, putting resilience in there alongside those things. And then that forces you to ask the questions that Terry's asking too, which is about how do we measure it and, and those sorts of things and what are our indicators that m mean something to us. So, yeah, I haven't seen that, Terry, this, this stuff from, from um, Tony Vin Vincent, uh, so I can't really comment on it. But I know there's lots of work going on to try and get these better measures of, of you know, sort of the quality of life, well-being, you know, the, the rural resilience, um, the regional well-being survey, those types of things, I think are starting to get that, you know, sense of safety, sense of community belongingness, participation, those sort of measures that are, are really starting to get there, but we still need some better measures of this kind of stuff. Um, Paul, I think we might um, leave the... Um question and answer session now. Um, if people want to stay online for a more informal chat, please do so. Um, but I'd just like to say on behalf of the team, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this webinar series. And of course, a big thank you to Paul Ryan, our presenter. Um, we'll end the recording now, but please stay on if you want to have a bit more of a chat. Um, don't forget to complete the survey for your chance to win Charlie's book. And please note, we'll send a follow-up email with all the links and resources from this webinar series. So until then, have a great day, everyone, and stay online if you want more of a chat.